All right, so it says we are technically live streaming here uh, at the at Red or Green Books here on Facebook. Welcome, welcome everyone to our June author talk. I'm so excited. Today we have Tori Lutz and her incredible book, Schoolyard Crushes and Prozac Prescriptions. Uh, she's just uh, simply wonderful. Don't you love when people hold up your book on the screen? Like, I yeah. do. I still remember <laughs> the first time you did that, like before I even had my physical copies and you're like, oh my God. Look like yes. <laughs> it's so much fun uh to to actually be saying like i have a copy of your book and you guys can have um absolutely can get your own signed copy as well uh by going to redergreenbooks.com and picking up your copy of schoolyard crushes on prozac prescriptions five dollar off coupon code is crushes uh crush it uh all of the sales from uh the book club in the month of the author is there goes straight to the author so please please just do that that means the book's only ten dollars it's practically free let's go right shipping handling not included but you you know this is still it's nominal all right so some quick announcements as we get rocking and rolling if you've not been to our youtube channel yet please do so i went back and uploaded all of our old videos to youtube from our original authors back in 2021 um all of our authors from 2022 and so far all the events that we've had in 2023 so everything's been uploaded it's such a wonderful thing to go back and watch all these people right when they first launched their books and you're like oh my god i remember this uh so many fun things that we've done um in the first couple of years that we been around so please please go to the youtube channel we also have the book launch for out loud we have the book launch for american graveyard so it's it's not just the individual authors it's also these incredible anthologies that we've been publishing so uh go check that out and see what those are all about um, coming this coming Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern is a double feature here at The Word is Right. And we're featuring Vex Lex and Tabitha Adams. They are two of our newest um, authors who are debuting in the 2023 Debut Poets launch. And so if you would like to come get to know them, uh, meet them, hear some of their work, uh, they're going to be double featuring. And that is an open mic. So you are welcome to come and join us Friday night. Uh, today's event, though, is it's not an open mic. It's really all about the only poet who matters the, in the month of June, and that is Tori Lutz. Uh, happy Pride, Happy Father's Day also for those of you uh, who are, are fathers, um, who have fathers. Thank you all so much uh, for being here today. All right, well, let's go. So uh, today, you know, we're, we're talking schoolyard crushes and Prozac prescriptions by the one and only Tori Lutz. I had the opportunity to meet this incredible human being through, I believe, through Instagram. And uh, we we have, maybe not, maybe through Nick, but we have some really similar friends uh, through poetry. And that's how we connect, right? That's how we connect with one another is by just uh, being in the same rooms oftentimes with one another. And I heard her work and I was just so blown away at first. I was like, whoa, who is this woman? Uh, I need to I need to know more about her. And I was like, can I buy your book? And she said, I don't have a book. And I was like, what? Oh my God, we have to fix that immediately. Like remedy that right now. And so I invited her to publish uh, in the winter, uh, the debut poets in the winter of 2021. And it has been nonstop ever since then. Uh, her book is is just uh, a beautiful, beautiful book. And I think it's just so interesting. Your your cover is one that I get sometimes the most comments on at live events. They look at it and they're like, "Oh, that sounds like an interesting book." Uh, so definitely, uh, it, it, you should y'all just go get her book. Get it in the month of June so you can get the coupon code. So Tori, um, before we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the show today. Kind of tell us a little bit about you, uh, where you've been, where you're at, where you're going, a little bit about how the book came about, what can people expect in the book, a little bit about your journey to um, uh, arrive at this book, and then I'll read some of the reviews for your book and bring you up for your feature, and then after the feature, we'll kind of talk, we'll do a little dialogue, a Q&A, all that good stuff. Okay, so that's a whole can of worms, so I think that usually the best place for me to start when it comes to like where everything came from and my journey with poetry and everything is kind of um when I who I was in high school and like I, I saw a post once that I related to a lot where it's like oh it's the ghost of Christmas past but it just reads your high school poetry and you just because ah. I mean you know I wasn't you know out the gates like right like I knew some people who like were 15 and I'm just like oh my god like that sounds like Ezra Pound over here but um I remember when I first was introduced to poetry like it didn't really make sense to me because I was introduced to poetry by like old dead white guys who were writing about trees um 
and the thing is that like while a lot of that has obvious merit and is beautiful and I can appreciate a lot more now that I have more understanding of literature um it was something that a like 12 13 14 year old Tori wasn't really inspired by I was inspired by songwriters I um learned guitar when I was 12 and I was ready to be the next Taylor Swift and I was like I loved you know write all of my experiences and you know just kind of live life through lyrics and then I kind of was introduced to Sylvia Plath when I was 16 and, and confessional poetry and I learned that poetry didn't have to be about trees and it didn't have to be pretentious and it didn't have to be just about a bunch of stuff that I didn't understand or at the time even care about um it could be about your experiences in your life and so I was like oh I can do what I'm doing with songwriting in poetry and so I started writing really shitty poetry um and I was kind of getting into it and then I was introduced to button poetry um and spoken word poetry through that I think Sarah Kay and Sabrina Benaim were two of the ones who like really got uh, me into it and then I know Sabrina has done stuff with word is right um since then and she also has uh, hosted workshops and I've taken one of her workshops so I have a very special attachment to her but that introduced me to spoken word poetry which as a lyricist and a musician that was a game changer for me because I was like not only can I write about the things that I am actually feeling pouring out of me I can perform poetry and um, so I combined those loves and then I went off to college and I joined a poetry organization that was almost entirely performance poetry. And my time at Poetic Lyricism was incredibly formative. I really found my voice through there. I did a lot of shows. I was constantly doing workshops. I, like, I don't know if I've ever had as much poetry in my life as I had um, in my undergraduate because of Poetic Lyricism and my involvement with it. Um, and so then I kind of started to feel that kind of lacking from my life after I graduated college. I was living in New York and then the pandemic hit. And so any spoken word in person, open mic kind of things with poetry that I could find, which I already was struggling to find to the same caliber, it was just gone. Um, everybody was, you know, making banana bread and working out from home and the whole, all the stuff that we remember from the pandemic. And then one thing I started doing um, that my friend Sarah introduced me to was online open mics. Um, and so I got in, involved in, um, or building publishing houses. I got involved in a lot of, I got like the New York Cafe, um, Word is Right things. I just was joining all these Zoom calls where everybody was doing open mics over Zoom. And that was putting me in the rooms of people that I otherwise probably never would have been in the rooms of, which was kind of cool. Because, for example, you're in New Mexico. I probably never would have ended up in a New Mexico open mic situation in my life. I live in now Miami and at the time New York. Um, but yeah, at that time, um, Word is Right and um, Red or Green Books was really kind of just forming. And I really felt a lack in my poetry career in the form of, I don't have a book. Why don't I have a book yet? I've written a lot of poetry. I've performed a lot of poetry. I have always wanted to write a book in my life since I was small, even before poetry was what I imagined that book being. I always wanted to write a book. So I wrote this mostly um, during the pandemic and in 2021 and got it put out in winter of 2021. So this book, I, I, definitely have an emotional attachment to it and it's just like what did you do during the pandemic and it's I mean I I didn't do a lot but I did do this <laughs> like there was there was a lot of silence and quiet moments and that gave me actually the space to be able to put together and put out a book um so that was that was the blessing that I was able to find in a very very lonely time um but I wrote the book and I, I thought of the title um, because I was thinking a lot at the time I had reconnected with this person who now is no longer in my life and should not be. But it was one of those people that um, it was my first love. And as a result, it was a rebound over and over again. Like anytime I would break up with someone, I would come running back and it because it was familiar. And so um, that was just such a fixture in my life for most of my life. And so was my, you know, journey with mental health. I got my first uh, Prozac prescription actually 
um, during the pandemic. I was trying antidepressants and Prozac was the first one. And I was like, Prozac prescriptions is such a literary thing. And I'm just like, well, schoolyard crushes and Prozac prescriptions um, is how the title came about. And I actually, the title is probably one of the things I'm most proud of with this book. I really do like that title. <laughs> and it's the thing that people most say to me when I tell them my book, they're like, what's it called? What's it called? That's awesome. Um, but anyway, it really navigates the similarities between um, love and mental health because they seem like two different types of writing that I do because I write about both of those things a lot. And I'm like, but there's so much like intersection because it's all about firsts and uncertain waters and navigating things. So I was like, what if I write a book kind of about both? Um, and so I did. And so really the point of the book is not just love poems. It's not just mental health poems. It's not even love and mental health poems. It's really just about navigating firsts in your life and also like reflecting um, on those firsts when you're no longer in a position where it's like, oh, I'm new at this. Like, it's like, I know the mental health game now. I know relationships now, but I still remember um, all those formative experiences. So this is kind of like a love letter to those experiences. And now I am trying to think of like what my next project's going to be. I, I was, I remember when I put this out, I was like, oh, I want to stick to like a two year timeline. Like every two years I'll put out a book. And now I'm sitting here. I'm like, oh, I put this out in 2021. It's 2023. So what's my next book? Um, but I have ADHD. And so I constantly work with about 10 works in progress at the same time. Um, and so I can't even tell people for sure, which the next book is going to be, but it is a priority I'm making right now is to try to at least get a draft put together that I can start to be like, okay, now what do I do with this and make my next book? And that would be exciting to finally be able to announce, but I still have a lot of love for this book. I still read from it at open mics. Um, and I, I just even though I've read all these poems a million times, because now this has been my only book that I have um, for the past two years, I've been reading from it, but, but it's still special to me and I'm always still probably going to read from it. And, um, and yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at. I'm at, I'm in another poetry workshop right now with Blythe Baird. That's been exciting. And I have my second class today um, after this actually. <laughs> Um, but but yeah that's that's kind of the Tori Lutz poetry story for the most part and so I hope that a lot of that kind of comes across in this book because I think first projects are very important because it kind of shows what that artist was when they were first really you know breaking out and like their first concept of what they wanted their art to be like you can find that in their first projects so I'm always going to have a special attachment to this book but, and you're yeah. so right when you when you talk about the pandemic, you're right. You talk about COVID, like how everything changed. And now we're suddenly online, and finding that kind of validation for mental health, for heartbreak, for grief, right? I think about a lot of the people in your launch at the end of 2021, like you know, Gigi had just lost her dad, right? Um, you know, Jen Relissimo had his own stuff. So th there was so much, you know, Pam Rice, where her book is all about mental health, right? So having all of you, you know, talking about things that were so real and things that are so monumentally important to talk about that really, you know, maybe we wouldn't have talked about or, or not talked about so openly had we not all validated each other in Zoom rooms or, or on lives or, you know, heard from other poets. So I think like what you did was really kind of lay the foundation for so many people to be able to talk about these things. Uh, and, and so it was very brave to do your book. It was very courageous to do your book. And the way you did it was just, it's so like, di like uh, where people can take it and stew in it, but not feel bored or scared or alone. They feel like you're holding their hand along the way through the journey of the book. And so um, it was a very brave thing to write that and Thank to you. kind of be like one of the leaders in the press to talk about 
uh, some of these topics. So yeah, y'all need to just get her book. She'll sign it and send it to you. It's only $10. That's practically free. <laughs> but the coupon code crushes, it, it's, it ends uh, at the last day of June. So you have to get it by June 30th to get the coupon. Otherwise, Tori, like where, where can people find you, follow you, all that stuff so that, um, it, you know, perhaps they're watching this live back after June or after the fact and they can't get the coupon anymore. Like how can people find you, get a copy of your book, all that stuff? So the easiest way is my Instagram. Um, it's Tori Lutz Poetry at Instagram. It's a pretty straightforward um, handle. And in that Instagram profile, there's my link tree. And so it has links to anything. It has links to my like cash app and Venmo. If you're feeling philanthropic, um, it has, you know, links to where you can order my book from me directly. It has all sorts of stuff on there. And I post haikus all the time. So there's poetry. Um, but yeah, Tori Lutz Poetry at Instagram is the best place to find any, anything with my book. So Awesome. That sounds good. And if you want to watch Tori Letts um, for past performances here at Red or Green Books during the winter 2021 book launch, just go to the YouTube channel or go to the Facebook page because that'll have uh, all of those um, older videos that have the original launch of the books. Uh, so if you want to see really you know, what that was like back then. I say back then, but it feels like the pandemic was a while ago, right? It feels like we're kind of back to some sort of sense of normalcy among poets. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and let Tori do her thing. Uh, and she's got 30 minutes to do whatever it is that she would like to do in that time. And then we'll come back and we'll end with a little Q&A, uh, a little bit of like what's next, all that good stuff. Sound good? Do you need anything, Tori? I don't think I need anything. I think I'm just okay. going to read from my book. I think that that's probably the best way to spend um, the 30 minutes or so. So I am gonna start by reading the introduction to the book because it's gonna repeat a couple of things that I said, but it really gives an idea of what the intention of this book was and, and then what's in it. Um, so, so much of our emotional development in the most formative years of our lives can be tied to the little moments that make up the biggest pictures. First loves, first losses, first clumsy and painful navigations through our own mental health, Many of the most passionate and striking memories can be found in these firsts that have brought us to new chapters in life. This book is about those firsts as well as the roads they can lead down. It captures both the giddy joy of new experiences as well as the jaded retrospection of an older self. We may no longer be our innocent childhood selves, but the stories from that era in our lives became the clay that molded who we are now. From my first kiss to my first mental health prescription, I have grown and changed and lived so much. This is my attempt at a love letter to all of those beautiful moments that made themselves a part of the mosaic I now see in the mirror. After all, some of the shiniest things are made up of little broken fragments. I hope this collection speaks to all of your glittering pieces as well. May the picture they create give everything you've carried a purpose. So, and I actually quote Life Baird in here um, as the first first quote in the book that I have it's a uh, come back to the city it was easiest for you to breathe in and I put that because this was this book was also put together at a time where I was getting very homesick while in New York and I was missing Miami and I was realizing that it's not necessarily a failure if I go back home it doesn't mean that I didn't make it outside of home it just means that sometimes the best place for you to be is there and so that is what I did. And now I am back here in Miami. But um, but anyway, I'm going to start with the first poem in the book. It's called, But First, a Disclaimer. Mi vida. I've never been good at letting go. If I were to touch poison ivy, I wouldn't snap my hand back and scramble to heal that burn. I'd sit among the weeds and wrap myself in a blanket of stinging stars. I'd fall asleep, not even recognizing the itch as something wrong, because at least it's familiar. At least it's a pain I can recognize, can sleep off, can pretend is all in my head like everything else. And then the next poem I'm gonna read is one of my favorites to perform. Um, and it's my friend who's also in the press, Nick Paleologos, it's his favorite in the book. So this is called Suffocating. Breathe in, breathe out. On a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? One meaning one foot in the grave and the other barely grabbing the edge. 10 meaning tenacious, vivacious, and every other aceous that can describe how elated you are. Maybe you're feeling a five if you're doing just fine. There 
is no right answer. Of course, unless you consider anything below a four, the right answer for because we care for you and can't let anything bad happen. Let's lock that shit down before it becomes a problem because we can't have you. I mean, you, I, I mean, your brain shutting down on us now, but answer honestly on a scale of one to 10. How are you feeling today? No pressure, but you aren't the only one with problems and we need to know how serious this is before we can move on, move on. Can you at least say a six? Sorry, sick of this. No, at least a six. I'll jot down a seven. If it's all the same to you, then you look chipper enough today. Keep that head up. We all know what happened when you last reached a two, a two as in two fucking bad. You've got shit to do. I think we could aim for an eight by tomorrow. If you ate before tomorrow, we could even put a nine, but I'm not even sure you're there yet. So it's asinine to shoot too high. How about that seven again? What? Three. That won't do. You see that has to be documented, prioritized, considered a problem. Other people have real problems. Can't you see we don't have time for a crisis? If you're gonna fuck up, at least do it right. Breathe in, breathe out. And then we're going to ease more to the love side of the book. And we're going to read Love in Cursive. They say don't bring a knife to a gunfight. But I think my problem is bringing love letters to a knife fight and the knives always end up deep in my back before I can even get past the first few lines, choking and gargling a perverted variation of what those pages were supposed to be. Crumpled up and torn now in the pockets of my jeans, I wonder what a full letter would sound like out loud. Would it sound like the stained glass cage around my heart shattering into a million little glittering pieces? grinding into a fine kaleidoscope of dust maybe that's just me romanticizing another missed opportunity okay and we're gonna do a little more love this is called call it what you want to believe in a soulmate is an arrogant thing it is to believe that you are as perfect for someone as it can get as perfect for them as you know they are for you can you instead sit with me then at the top of the double slide? I can tell you secrets I pinky promise I've never told anyone else before that I don't want to go home, that I like you, that I want you, that I love you, that I need you, that however I gravitate toward or away from you is instinct that can't be explained by the words and languages I have spent the better half of my life mastering, loving, Maybe that's why you were the first person I'd always look for in hide and seek. Maybe that's why we seem to spend the rest, the interactions of our lives still playing even after everyone else has gone home. And now we're going to scooch back to some mental health. This is actually a poem that I wrote in college while at Poetic Lyricism, but it just fits so seamlessly into the topic of this book that I cleaned it up and I made it uh, more visual because I like to do visual things with my poems um, because this was originally just performance poetry and I put it right in here but this is called that bitch next door she's a bitch she envelops you like humidity calls you at 2 3 4 a.m till you abandon sleep completely dictates when you can do anything that makes you happy she takes you and breaks you and makes you into fragments of yourself that are too sharp to put back together but too dull to make anything worthwhile she locks you in your room regardless of your plans slowly closes around your neck with her cold bare hands and you will be damned before she begins to let go she plucks your loved ones out of your life demands 100 percent of your undivided attention and bleeds your every emotion bone dry after a while, her name will be etched into your skin, marking her territory and reminding you that she owns you, knows you, chose you. Her stopwatch can freeze your life, dissolve the future, warp the past, make second feels like years and years feel like mountains you were never meant to climb. And she's always armed and ready when things fall apart as she innocently numbs your pain until your emotions evaporate completely before your eyes and leave you holding on to nothing but the air that has become too 
fit to breathe. She contorts your passions into nuisances with an artful subtlety that makes it seem like your own belief. She holds you with a comforting familiarity that almost makes you scared to let her leave. And oh, you can try to make her leave, make her stop knocking and talking and prodding, erase the voice from your memory and her fingerprints from your heart, but you can't put band-aids on a geyser and think it'll be silenced. You can't beat down a monster that doesn't bleed. You can't fight her off without fighting yourself because her permanent address is inside your head. Depression is a bitch. And she doesn't give a damn who thinks so. All right, and then I'm going to read a poem that uh, is actually a classical form called a villanelle. I first was introduced to villanelles through Sylvia Plath, actually, in high school. One of her poems that we looked at in class was Mad Girl's Love Song. And I still, when I've taught workshops and I've taught villanelles in workshops, I use that as the example because I just think it's such a brilliant topic to use a villanelle for because villanelles are a very cyclical kind of form where you repeat lines a lot and a mad girl's love song is about madness and insanity and circling back and it it is just I've always found that so brilliant because it's not just using a form to use a form it's using a form that serves the poem so I wrote this poem called cul-de-sac with similar intentions in mind where it's supposed to kind of be a cyclical thing so cul-de-sac with lessons learned on roads that never end, I'm sure I've seen all I can see until I've lost my equilibrium again. I learned to ride my bike when I was 10. The cul-de-sac would test my grit and will with lessons learned on roads that never end. I gave my youth to feel what love had meant. Although I'd say the ache was worth the thrill, I've lost my equilibrium again. The pains that come with growing up don't mend. This child has learned to fight, to hide, to kill with lessons learned on roads that never end. I sat and cried outside a CVS. They had no scripts to get my pills refilled. I've lost my equilibrium again. And so it seems that just around the bend will always be a way to take a spill. With lessons learned on roads that never end, I've lost my equilibrium again. All right, and then this song, this song, this poem <laughs> is, um, it's called Gold Exchange for Liquid Copper, and it touches on addiction, which is something I definitely dealt with a lot in the pandemic, because when you're unemployed and stuck inside, it is very easy to just drink or do whatever it is that you're addicted to and normally would have things to distract you from it. So this is Gold Exchange for Liquid Copper. If I pulled my childhood self aside and told her that one day we'd be able to inhale silver, swallow copper, turn golden moments into misty memories that almost erase the mistakes, would she believe in magic? After all, how many witches and warlocks, heroes and heroines have exchanged their happiness, family, dreams, love, future lives for their power? And isn't this like its own form of immortality after all? I wouldn't call it decay. The worms won't even want me. I taste too bitter. I guess even if you get the recipe perfect, you still end up with sour cake if you use spoiled ingredients. But how can such glittering things be rotten? Silver and gold racing down my throat, filling my chest, my abdomen, my vat of promises that I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Turns out that if I get as wasted as my potential, I don't care. I feel good. All right. And uh, this is a little heavy. Um, this is called The Night I Almost Ruined a Life. I actually wrote it in one of Sabrina Benign's workshops. She gave us a prompt that um, was right about something terrible in your life from the other person's perspective, like they're the victim. And I've used that prompt now too in my workshops because I just think that that's so brilliant because there are so many ways you can take that. And um, that inspired this poem um, called The Night I Almost Ruined a Life. I coated my throat in Irish whiskey to prove I could keep up with the boys. The two of us were drinking like Hemingway, real writers. Last one still sober wins. Last one still standing, 
wins. Last one with a hope of a memory of the entire ordeal gets the trophy. Secretly, I knew I didn't want to win. I love winning, but I love forgetting more. Slicing my thoughts into ice cubes to fill my glass, washing it down with swigs straight from the bottle, poor John Doe had to deal with me. Poor John Doe had to lift me onto his bed. Poor John Doe had to remind me of everything that just happened and brew me tea. Had to chase me half naked around the parking lot until I realized I had nowhere to go and came back inside. Lent me a book to pretend to read. Gave me a pen to write my damn self a letter. Didn't sleep until 5 a.m. Almost had his life ruined when I pondered telling anyone anything I remembered or imagined. His hand on my thigh, his fist around my arms, his sweat on my skin. Maybe that's why I still can't say his name. Maybe that's why I couldn't ruin his life back. I hope the next girl is less forgiving. I hope she shows her teeth and is out for blood, his blood, blood to refill her own veins and use as ink for his sentencing. I hope John Doe will never be the same. I hope he will never forget her like he did me. Okay. So I'm going to show you a poem. I'm not going to read it because it's not my favorite poem in the book, but I am proud of this. I made a poem that looks like flip-flops. That was actually very difficult to get it into the book and make sure it fit in the margins. So I am happy that this exists, <laughs> but um, I'm going to bring the mood back up a little bit with a poem that I think is a little bit funny um, called If Hallmark Made a Card for Everything. How many puns could they make out of sorry about your colonoscopy? How many cardboard castles might be dedicated to sweet romantic musings for the side chick on Valentine's Day? What colors would they use to capture a sorry your parents sold your childhood home condolence card? I bet they'd have a hell of a time figuring out the details for a congrats on losing your virginity pop-up or perhaps something more along the lines of sorry I came in 17 seconds IOU would be a more likely bestseller. I doubt I speak for just myself when I say I'd be browsing the fuck that guy girlfriend cards if the aisles went on forever and the cardstock depicted every godforsaken human emotion, experience, wish, mistake. What sentiments might overfill my mailbox and what cheesy one-liners would I feel compelled to stuff into crinkly envelopes? Maybe if everything came on an overpriced compulsory gesture, we'd have less question marks and more, how the fuck did you find a card for my eating disorder? What drawer does this even get stuffed into? God, can't Homer go back to making fucking movies instead? I thought they profited off of people's innate horror at being honest. All right. And then this is another, this is a very pandemic poem because I actually wrote it based on images that were very real in my own kitchen um, when I was having a problem with drinking. And so this is called Drunk in My Kitchen's Church. The Blood Orange is a real character. I don't remember how you got stuck in my throat. No, this isn't another sexy poem. No, this isn't another trauma poem. This, my darling, is my exhaustion at gargling my own heartbeat. This, my love, is my frustration at counting bees in my veins as I try to calm down, calm down, calm down. This, my dear, mi vida, is my plea for release from the chokehold of my own nonsense. And it's funny because anyone who is also fed up with this barbed wire sweater has known since about five seconds in what this concoction of ramblings and cacophony of nonsensical characters is about. Yes, my lover my steadfast anxiety, and oh, I'd have loved to maintain ambiguity, to maintain the cloak of imagery, of metaphor, of abstract that would turn this into an artful piece of writing instead of an on-the-nose cry for help. But I think I cut my nose off to spite the mind behind it a long time ago, if you get me, and I'm just tired now. Sana, sana, colita de rana doesn't work for everything. I'm tired of choking on wine to stop hyperventilating, to give myself a tangible problem to deal with so I don't stay doggy paddling up shit's creek. Yes, it's okay if you laughed at that image. It's fucking funny. But yes, it's also okay if you frowned. If you're wondering why I'm not committed. 
If you're stuck between pity and horror with no idea where the scale is supposed to balance out because I am constantly all of those things at once when I'm in this poem, when I'm dancing with the words on the page, trying to make them love me, trying to make them my friend, to make them more than worn out life vests that squeeze a little too tight on some days and don't even inflate at all on others. It's either this or splashing sour red wine on white countertops, ruining an innocent blood orange that was in the way. And it was only kind of worth it. The wine is shit. It tastes like communion. But maybe that's a good way to keep me from overfilling the glass again. I wish I could tell you that this poem was drunk, that it splashed out of me, that it was spaced out or high or driven by some force that wasn't my own. Because honestly, it's embarrassing that this is the most coherent stream I've stitched together in about a year. And I thought that was the inspiration people moved to New York to find. God, I hope think I'm crazy because at least I know you'll think of me now we're going to scooch back to love poems for a little bit with uh I missed the blisters on my feet I used to walk barefoot to your house I was 14 and dirt didn't bother me the crunch of leaves the texture of grass and sidewalk cracks were worth callous toes it's rare for me to leave my shoes behind nowadays after all, the cold ground prickles my feet now since I left the sun back with you in my hometown and my body knows that this time I'm not walking to you. All right, I'm gonna do a little cute one that's small. Um, this is called Astronomy Lessons. I am so sorry it took me so long to realize you could love me and more than the abstract. I've been grasping at stars and constellations that have long since burned out while you have been waiting to fill my rib cage with entire galaxies. Please forgive me for being too starstruck to let you hold me. And this poem I consider kind of a good example of the intersection of the mental health and love poems. Um, Cause I was kind of thinking of both at the same time while I wrote it, but this is called Child in Me. I'm stronger than the little girl who was scared to admit she liked you, who asked her diary when she might get her first kiss and what the tingles meant. I'm older than the child who fell for everything that tasted sweet, who may have danced awkwardly, but also danced passionately when you weren't looking. But I hope you still see her sparkle in my eyes if you look closely. And then another small poem that... Um, I think is one of the lightest poems in the book is called Littlest Surprises. And I think every woman is going to relate to this poem. You were the prom dress I fell in love with. You hugged my curves and held my eyes, pushed me out of my comfort zone in the best ways. And I didn't even notice until I took you home and tried you on in my own mirror in my own room that you have pockets on top of it all. All right, um, this one is called I Drown in My Own Spotlight. And it's kind of about when we're all a little bit scared that we might actually be narcissists um, because we have a little bit of main character syndrome. Um, but yeah, this is I Drown in My Own Spotlight. I can see myself in all I experience, the protagonist of my own story, the self-absorbed anxiety that rests underneath the placid waters of my humility. When I see a swallow, I don't see a bird. I see my panic scrambled. Oh shit, I set my alarm for PM weekday pandemonium. I see the harmony to my morning coffee. When I see a pen, I don't see stationery. I see my sword, my lifeline, my claim to fame and the tool behind my own signature. When I see you with her, I don't see a love story. I see my own reflection scattered among the shards and dust of a shattering mirror. And this poem I wrote when it was becoming abundantly clear uh, every single day that J.K. Rowling is more of an asshole than she was yesterday. Um, because <laughs> Harry Potter was uh, when I first fell in love with reading and when I first fell in love with writing and storytelling. And um, it shaped a lot of who I was as a kid. And it saved me in a lot of ways when I was having bad days and I needed friends and didn't have any I was like oh I have Harry and Ron and Hermione and then JK Rowling just downloaded Twitter one day um so this is called don't tweet your heroes or if you do make sure you're drunk or stoned 
or a little bit of both because heroes are bones and bones build palaces, become foundations of belief systems, of dreams, of expectations, but give them the chance to supply their own sticks and stones and I promise they will never be the weapons you expected. God knows they'll never stick around long enough to save you, to live up to the benefit of your doubt. God knows at the end of the day, heroes are humans too. Heroes are failures too. Heroes might as well be you. So this is another little bitty poem um, because I like the little ones. Um, this is called Evergreen. You never forget or lose your grip on your first love. It's life's purest connection, the smell of smoke that takes you from childhood to fairy tale to loss and back again with something as mundane as a Polaroid, a yearbook, a pressed flower from a corsage that's long since wilted. All right, and this is perfect timing with the broken watch, which was kind of exactly how the whole rebound thing never actually, you know, had a full length relationship with this person. And yet they make up so much of my life. Um, perfect timing with a broken watch. I wonder what would happen if we missed each other at the same time. Would the universe flip inside out, rewriting destiny's entire playbook just so we could bump into each other? If we loved each other at the same time, would all the particles in the galaxy finally buzz in harmony? Would the earth stop turning for a fraction of a second like the jolt of a missed heartbeat? Would time freeze? Would the dust settle? Would everyone else's face blur over for just a moment? Like the first time you kissed me? Maybe. All right. And this is called Cracked Glass Confessions. Telling you everything wrong with me felt like a death sentence. The last amount of pressure that would shatter the fishbowl and flood the house with poison that would never fit inside a container again. Every atom in my body was sure you would choke on my alphabet soup of fucked up. That you would curse my name with your last breaths of innocence, of normalcy, of peace. I mourned you before I even finished the sentence. And yet, you're here. You're breathing. You're placing that fishbowl on a higher shelf to keep it safe and to keep me dry. All right, we're gonna do a few more. So I'm gonna to try to plan ahead a little more to make sure I know which ones I wanna do. All right, this is called Phantom in a Bottle. I hope you can't taste the ghost of whiskey in the back of my throat when you kiss me. I followed my fears to the bottom of the bottle and it led me here, showing you my worst, my most bitter, most pathological, I don't know if a clear head and a quiet heart would have emptied this out of me like the contents of a hope chest. And I don't know how you still look at me like that. Like I'm brave, like I'm good. Maybe you're a little wasted too. And this one is about anyone who's um, been to the ER or been Baker acted or in a psych ward. Or... We all know about the grippy socks. We all... <laughs> We all know about those, like they're often either like blue or yellow or some pastel and they've got little grips at the bottom. Um, so mine are blue. <laughs> These are, this poem is called uh, Psych Ward Socks. You have a better grip on anything than I ever will. Pale blue, like my eyes yet calmer, soothing and smoothing even the toughest wrinkles. You're my quietest trophy. Proof that my pain is certifiable and survivable. Everyone who also knows you will recognize you and the rest linger on you the same as any sock. The ones with the tacos are cuter anyway, but you, you don't need the flair, the distractions. You're the opposite, steadfast and solid and one of the only pairs with whom I could never part. Those stuck up taco socks could never make me smile through the tears like you. They could never stay soft through special occasion only use. Thank you for your service as a souvenir on my worst days. Thank you for keeping me warm through a different kind of cold. I don't always remember the cacophony of thoughts, fears, unmentionables that sent me to the ER that night that left me catatonic and my mother terrified, but you, I know you. You are a permanent staple in my wardrobe, even though you'll never be worn from use. Thank you for being the uniform of a night I survived without knowing I would. All right. I'm going to do another form poem. This is a pantoum. It's similar to a villanelle in terms of being rep repetitive, but it's kind of like a puzzle. I love writing these because I, I really do write them like puzzles. 
Um, and I plug the repeated lines in where they're supposed to go. So this is answering echoes. Do your ears ring when I write about you? My pens are running out of ink. Another sun has gone down. I soak my tongue in sour wine. My pens are running out of ink. My desk is covered in crumpled pages. I soak my, song, my tongue in sour wine. Maybe it'll look different in morning light. My desk is covered in crumpled pages, poetic origami. Maybe it'll look different in morning light. Maybe one more glass will make it right. Poetic origami. My words are tumbling in a foreign tongue. Maybe one more glass will make it right. Do your drinks whisper about me too? My words are tumbling in a foreign tongue. Another sun has gone down. Do your drinks whisper about me too? Do your ears ring when I write about you? All right. And then I am going to close this with a poem called Pretty Pills. If love could be measured in milligrams, I'd overdose on you. Pack you into my Pez dispenser and make a coma taste like candy. You're the kind of medicine that doesn't need a chaser, the kind of danger that leaves the good type of burn in my throat, chest, stomach, and feels better than healing. If only you weren't so damn pretty, maybe then I'd read the directions, the warning label. Maybe then I'd remember I'm not choking on sweethearts as my eyes flutter shut. Thank you. Let's go, let's go, Tori, let's y'all, let's go. Y'all could mm -hmm. unmute your mics uh, and and cheer her on for her incredible feature Woo! reading. Yeah. Woo oh my God, right? It's just so wonderful. It's so brave, it's so creative. I mean, I was even tapping into my inner Joni Mitchell uh, during during your Best read. I just, I've ever <laughs> right? Um, Yes, it's I love it. I love it. Um it's it, yeah, I and, and now that you say New Yo, I mean we might have even met at New Yo. I think we did. Um and, and and I was like, wow, wow, this woman. Uh so the pandemic really was such a great um bridge for so many places and uh so many poets to experience themselves and and experience each other and and really kind of the evolution of spoken word uh covid kind of fast tracked that for so many uh so many authors and i was totally stunned when she told me she didn't have a book out and you know we were we were really just a fledgling uh, press really party trying to be part of the solution during a time when we felt that there was very little representation for women uh women of color uh, queer women who i identify as queer tori i believe you identify as queer as well so like you know for for having outlets for us to share our work to share our stories and to do it in a way where we're not going to continue to pimp ourselves out or get exploited by by publishing houses you know how do we how do we do that and so red or green books came about and you know we're female forward so we we publish a majority of women a majority of people of color and groups that have been historically marginalized and stigmatized so it's been this this wonderful thing uh to have to have this journey with you you know shocky g is in the room she's got her book coming out this summer with red or green books with the 2023 debut poets launch terry rose jertson is in the room she had her book come out with the 2022 debut poets launch and i got to meet both terry Rose and Tori Letts in New York City um, at the New York City Poetry Festival last summer. We we had over 200 people come to our booth specifically for our booth, right? We had uh, four, 40, uh, 12, we had 24 featured readers signed up to read that weekend just at our booth uh, for the New York City Poetry Festival and, and Tori Letts was one of them. So it was just so incredible to meet these people in person. They're real. <laughs> They are real human beings, I promise. It is <laughs> almost a little weird when, when we all like know each other over Zoom and then we're like, oh, but, you're you, know what, you know what? <laughs> you know what's so funny is the one person like nobody could have ever recognized was Jeff Cottrell. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't I had I didn't know it was Jeff until like like they like he was like leaving or I was leaving and I was like, oh 
know. <laughs> the other person I had a hard time recognizing at first was Elise Versella, um, because she looks so much like Sarah Aaron. And I was like, but so it's so funny, right? Because once you meet these people in person, um, it, it's so wonderful. And then like Elise had her mom with her. So, you know, you got to meet her mom. We got to meet Diane Ward. Like we, we got to meet so many people uh, who came to, to, to see us, right? When we were there, it was such a great experience. It, it absolutely changes, I think, everything. And you being part of this journey, being part of the press, you know, you know, having your book part of what we're doing and, and being along for the ride, it has laid the foundation for poets like Terry Rose and for Shockey to come and do what they're doing, you know, as far as, as getting their work out, getting their books out and their laying groundwork for the next, you know, group of people who are coming. So the legacy work uh, behind, behind what you're doing um, here uh, is just so amazing, uh, Tori. So get her book, right? Get her book, Schoolyard Crushes and Prozac Prescriptions through the month of June. Crushes is the coupon code for $5 off. So we'll just kind of do, I, I never re, I never pre-do my, my questions on these because I don't want it to sound like a canned type of dialogue, but like, what was the biggest thing that you learned that the thing maybe you were most afraid of and the thing you most learned or, or the, the best thing that came out of publishing your book? I think just like what the entrepreneurial and very real side of publishing is, um, because I think that like, I mean, especially just like growing up and be like, I want to write a book one day. It all seems like a lot of smoke and mirrors, like just the idea of um, what publishing is, what that means, money, um, bookstores and negotiating things and, and prioritizing your work and um, being your own like main person. Cause like, it, it's hard to explain what I felt like publishing was before I, I had a book published because it just, it just seemed like it just, you know, you send your book off to all of these publishing houses and someone says yes, but it turns out a lot of publishing houses don't even take unsolicited submissions. And it's just, it's a very, it's like a club and it's scary yeah. and it's, it's a lot of moving parts. And so it's, I mean, I know a lot more now, which is what I'm excited about with publishing books in the future in general is I just, I have more um, of an idea of like what I want um, when I publish a book and like what I want in um, like my experience to be like, because I actually didn't even necessarily know all the things to ask for before right. I had done it, you know, because like it's, it's hard to really, you know, negotiate for yourself or like be your, your number one supporter and advocate when you're not even really sure like what things to ask for or what things to look for and like a lot of contracts can be very scary um because you're like I don't know yeah. what it means if they're more than one page and they sound like a lawyer wrote them then they were not written for you that's kind of how I feel about it right yeah and you're totally right like we don't know what we don't know and you know everyone who comes for the debut poets launch are very green <laughs> They don't know a lot about what they're doing, but one of the things that we start doing at Red or Green Books is um, is a what next type of workshops where we take existing authors who've already gone kind of gone through the process, and they do a workshop on something, whether it's website building, whether it's promoting your book, whether it's um, doing merch, whether it's um, marketing, whether it's doing reels on social media, whether it's, you know, putting together a press kit, whether it's writing a letter of intent to submit your book or to feature somewhere, whether it's writing a, a press release for your book, you know, all these things, you know, how do you put a feature set together? Like there, There's a bunch of things. And then the, ne the next what next workshop is actually we're going to be doing AJ Houston, and he's going to talk about taking his book on the road. He spent about three, I think about like three months, two or three months, like just driving through this from, from Las Vegas, Nevada, all the way down through the South part of the United States, all the way up and back down around taking his book to different poetry venues and selling it. And like, what were the pitfalls? What were the successes? What were the takeaways? Because I know a lot of us are thinking about doing that. So by being able to pour back into the community, uh, pour back into the, the, um, the people here, we're able to kind of help 
push each other up. You know, Shaki does an incredible thing with her merch. She did a logo. She's got a bunch of merch. You know, I'm looking forward to doing a workshop with her, talking a little bit about how she did uh, the whole merchandising side of her brand, right? Because you're building your brand, you're building your platform, if that's your goal, right? Not all the time is that your goal as a writer. Sometimes you just want to have a book and you want your story documented and that's valid and that's okay. But if you're looking to supplement your income to where you can do it full time, you know, what does that really look like? And Terry Rose Dresden was asking, you know, how can she get your book? Um, so in the month of June, Terry Rose, um, there's a $5 coupon for the book. You can either get it through the website or you can just uh, send Tori Lutz some money and she'll send and, and your address. Of course, you need your address too. And she'll send you a signed copy uh, for, uh, for her book. So yeah, it's just wonderful. Um, and like, um, so moving forward, like, what do you think, of course, everyone's so scared, right? When they first publish, it's like so scary <laughs> and now you've done it. So it's maybe not quite so scary now. Like now you get to do the fun stuff. Now you get to do like the exciting, exciting new things. Like, what are you really excited about for the future? Um, and maybe what is your best piece of advice for people who are considering publishing? I think what I'm most excited for in the future is that I, I feel like I am a different person now in terms of just my knowledge for how to advocate for my own book and know what I want to look for and ask for. So I feel like in the future, publishing will be at least less stressful in that regard because it's something that I have done. So it's no longer like I feel like I'm jumping out of a plane and like, mm -hmm like just going for it and having to trust that other people have my best interests at heart, because that is, that is a scary thing to do. Um, because not everybody does for some reason, like the book writing world is incredibly exploitative in so many yes. corners of it. And it's like, it's not like we were making that much money off of it in the first place. So why are you why are you exploiting a poet? Oh my God. I just talked to a poet friend of mine in Chicago who's coming for the festival. He said that because his book didn't sell the amount of copies that they had anticipated, they're making him buy back all of the copies of his book. I saw um, someone who, I won't say her name in case she doesn't want this experience share, but one of the first shots she had at publishing her book was almost like a traumatic experience it was because it was it was basically a pyramid scheme and I was able when I looked at that contract for because I had been published at that point I was like this is not correct um because yeah. th they were asking her they were they, they were making her sell her book for like 35 dollars and like respectfully no one's gonna pay that um, for a book. I mean, like, even if it was like, like, even if it was like 300 pages, it would be a horrible pricing point. Like it, for a debut author, um, yeah. Unproven, book of poetry. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, I'm just like, so that's gonna be incredibly co cost prohibitive. Like even your loved ones are going to be like 30, 35, really? Ooh, that's a lot. Um, but also they were saying you had to it was it was like a, a a Kickstarter page, and you she had to have a guaranteed number of sales that was like absurd. It was yeah. like seven thousand dollars worth of sales, yeah, um, like guaranteed, or they would not even print it. And it's oh, yeah. like, I was like, girl, no. No, 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 see, it's so hard, right? It's so hard because you don't know what you don't know and yeah. you don't know where to go. And it's very difficult. Like you said, who do you trust? What do you do? When I built this press, I built it as a woman and a poet, right? I didn't, I mean, you, you have to have an entrepreneur mindset here because you know, you don't want to lose money. The goal is not to lose money, but I didn't mar mortgage my house to build this press. It's not reliant on the success to make sure that I keep a roof over my head. I got, it was very, very smart in trying to create it to to where I didn't uh, have to push anyone or press anyone or create any quotas or put any pressure on anyone to do anything. Like it was just meant to push people up and to just try to help people bloom and blossom in a way where nobody felt like they were losing uh, or felt pressure to do anything. Because once that happens, um, it creates a very, like you say, traumatic experience. And then again, you know, the way that a lot of contracts read is it pays first and foremost to press. And in the way our contracts read, it pay, pay, pays first and foremost the poet, right? We're the last to get paid, which is okay because, right, the investment is is on the back end for the for the authors for the press, right? So we're okay with that. We, we don't have a staff of 100. So we don't have a lot of overhead. So all those things are just so nice. But be aware of what you're signing. The other thing, too, is like making sure you understand that you're, you're you own the rights to your work. 
No one else owns the rights to your work unless you outright sale and you have a bill of sale for the rights of your work. Uh, so it, unless you're selling away your rights in the contract, you know, people should not be telling you when and where and how to share your work. Whether and that's I think online. That, that is like when, when, in terms of the question of like, what would I recommend to people who haven't been published is like, first and foremost, having the rights to your work is, is the most important thing, especially if you're uncertain, because if let's say it's like, it's a publishing house that it turns out you don't have the same values or you don't like, it's just, you're like, you know what? I don't, you don't want them to be able to hold your work hostage. You want to be like, okay, yeah. like this was fun. I'm going to go elsewhere because they'll be like, no, you can't because we own your book. And so like, that's, yeah, that's scary because then you are, you are stuck. And I think another thing that I would recommend to people is just know that what's best for you might not be what's best for a different poet. Cause like you were saying, people have different goals. Some people just want to see their books made. And that's why, like, I mean, I'm never going to judge people who like, like self publish like just through Amazon direct, like they just, they want copies of their book that they can, you know, take to open mics and show family members and stuff. And then some people are like, Oh, if it's not penguin house, it's, it's nothing. Um, like different people have different goals and different, different venues that will serve their goals best. And so it's like, like, don't let anybody be like, if you're not doing it this way, you're doing it wrong. Uh, because I mean, it would be nice, honestly, if there was a straightforward, like, this is how you become an author. Um, because a lot of career fields, it's like, it feels like, oh, they have a straightforward, here's this step. Now there's this step and here's, yeah. but, but with writing there, there are a lot of different, it's what you want to do with your book and how you want it done. Um, and unfortunately, as much advice as I can give you, the best way to do that is just doing it and trying to do it and possibly making mistakes and like, like learning and like learning that, for example, that you shouldn't go through a publishing house that is going to be a Kickstarter um, for your book and, and be like, you have to sell $7,000 worth of like $35 books. Um, it's so much pressure. It's so much, and it's so much pressure on a debut author. Right. And the problem is, is when you put that much pressure on someone who's new, who's just building their platform, they're building their brand, they're just launching, you know, they don't have enough clout yet. They don't have enough momentum built up to, to really get there. And so you're setting them up from for failure, essentially from the beginning. And then they get disheartened. They get depressed. They get sad. They get all the people who say you can't do it, you can't do it, you're not good enough. And that inner voice, it, it creeps up. And then they're seeing the numbers. and They're like, I just can't get there. I just can't get there. I'm not good enough. Why isn't it not get why is it not happening? And so then you become so despondent that you never write another book. Like it, it and it becomes so financially and infeasible to do that, because you just can't ever catch up financially to the possibility of doing another book. So yeah, you, you just you have to be aware of the economics behind what it is that you want to do but then also find the right place for you and if you don't know ask ask lots of people don't just trust me don't just trust tori don't just you know just don't don't just listen to what we're saying but go to lots of different places and go see go do your research go talk go look at lots of different contracts you know go out there and see what's out there because there there is a lot of really horrible shit out there um and and you know you don't know what you don't know and you like you know it it pains me it like i get I get viscerally full of just disdain uh, for those who take advantage of authors in this industry. That's why we built this press because I was so sick and tired of the exploitation, uh, especially for women, the lack of opportunity uh, that is out there. So um, yeah, just, just do, but, but I say it's legacy work and every story matters and no one can tell your story but you so just you know try to find a place where you feel safe where you feel comfortable who will help you through the process and get your book done um because there's the graveyard is full of untold stories right mm -hmm. that's what they say um so you know just get your done get your stuff done all right next month we have a uh, made of you by stephanie eisler vance uh she's going to be the july uh, the July book author, uh, book club author. And so the third Sunday of the month, we do our author talk right here at 1 p.m. Eastern. Get your copy of Schoolyard Crushes and Prozac Prescriptions by the one and only Tori Lutz. If you want to pick up her book, you can find her Tori Lutz Poetry on Instagram. Uh, hopefully she'll have a website coming soon because that would be dope. But her link tree is on her Instagram. So you can go to her link tree. You can see videos. You go back to the YouTube. You could totally go back to YouTube, Tori, and pull your features, pull those clips and put them on your link tree. 
I mean, True. all of that, right? Because you've had True. features, the word is right. You've had lo lots of stuff. So pull all those little videos and put them up on your lean tree because your work is just, is phenomenal. And, and your spoken word is just, it's just so moving, right? I mean, the page is amazing, but the spoken word is also amazing. So, to, you know, get her book, uh, but then watch her shows as well. I mean, $10 is practically for you guys, all right? So just get it. Get School Year Crushes and Prozac Prescriptions. The New Mexico Poetry Festival will be September 8th, 9th, and 10th. We have 20 22 readers there, uh, 16 flying in from out of state. The, the newest one we've added to the playbill is Jenna Soldier. He's on the Verb Bender Slam team that just took third as So Fried. He will be here and and he's doing a performance workshop. Like, come on. That is well worth the cost of admission right there. Tickets are only $25 uh, until August 1st, then they go up to 50. So we do have limited tickets available, but let's go. All right. Uh, Happy Pride, happy Father's Day. Uh, Tori, is there anything you would like to close with as we wind down the show? Um, Just right. I mean, like there was there was a point when I thought that I was only good at writing fiction or songs. And for a minute there, that was very true. My poetry was terrible. Um, but everything everything is subjective. Just keep keep doing it. I am 10 million times the poet that I was 10 years ago. And it's, I, I feel myself get better every year, but you have to do it. So the evolution, right? It's a process and you have a, you've documented it, right? And this is something no one can ever take away from you, which is, I think what people forget, right? Your book is always your book. This is your work. No one's ever going to take this away from you as something that is always going to be your work in your book. And so just do it, right? That sense of, that sense of accomplishment and like that, that that's mine. I did that. That is so profound, you guys. So just do it. Uh, if you, if anyone needs to reach out to word, uh, Red or Green Books or Word is Right, please do so. Social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Otherwise, Terry, uh, Terry, Terry Rose Jerson, I hope you get your signed copy. I see y'all are connecting in the chat. So yes, Terry Rose, uh, she's a wonderful supporter of um, the authors here at Red or Green Books. So maybe uh, you should also get, you know, consider Terry Rose Jerson's book. Um, her, she has photos uh, in her book. She has artwork. She has found poems, black of poems, white out poems. She's, she's also really funny. I love her sense of humor. Um, and Terry Rose, you've got a feature. You're going to be um, up here soon, aren't you, for book club? I was going to try to pull my notes up. Of course, my computer is super slow. Mm -hmm. Terry Rose yeah, Jerson will be September. <laughs> She, you, your sound kind of choppy there, my I friend. I in the calendar, so I don't know. Unless yes, I you're set. I got you. I got you down for September. We have Stephanie Eisler Vance, July. Pell Zingel uh, from Denmark will be August, and Terry Rose Jerson is September. So uh, that is it for today's show. Thank you so much, Tori Lutz, for for coming you. for your time for your author talk. Go buy her book. Coupon code crushes five dollars off. Uh, red or green books.com red is R E A D and we'll get you, uh, we'll get you a signed copy through June. Otherwise this will be full price, but you can still get a signed copy. Hit her up Tori Let's poetry on Instagram. Peace and blessings, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll see you back next month for the book club author talk with Stephanie Eisler Vance. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye.